time to look at our lives to see how we're doing and to make change to, to make confession and to make changes as we walk this walk of discipleship with Jesus and this Lenten se season we want to use the cha uh, Matthew chapter 6 as kind of our text and our vehicle to help us accomplish both of these goals or both of these tasks and so this morning we want to begin with Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 now the very first verse has a lot of power to it and a lot of challenge to it. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Now, in Judaism... Uh, especially the Judaism of Jesus' day, there were really kind of three pillars of uh, piety. And the word piety, that the New Revised Standard Version translate piety, comes from the Greek word really means righteousness. Okay? Doing righteousness in terms of trying to please God. And so the three pillars, the primary pillars were these. There was giving, there's almsgiving, there was praying, and there was fasting. So to be a, a good Torah-observant Jew, the Torah being their law, they're really the way of life that, they, that God had called them to be, uh, in terms of the practice of their faith, almsgiving, giving to the poor, praying, and fasting were kind of the three major ways that you would, that you would practice your faith. And so in Matthew chapter 6... Jesus is going to be looking at these different three different pillars of almsgiving, praying, and fasting, all in the light of this first verse of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Now, it's really amazing when you think about it, the hunger that we have as people for accolades for titles uh, to be to be lifted up in front of other people and also uh, in the area of our practicing our own faith even in the area of religion the the motivation and the desire the hunger for accolades and rewards is really quite astonishing it's it's enormous and so Jesus is taking this head on. So he's saying, if you're going to be my disciple in the kingdom of God, what goes on inside of you is what God is really looking at. It's not the external things that you're doing, but it's really what's going on inside of your heart. What is the motivation that's going on inside of you? That's the thing that really counts. Are you, doing these, are you doing these to give pleasure to God or approval or to receive approval from other people? And Jesus is saying very clearly that whatever our practices are, whatever our religious, our spiritual, our practices might be, they need to emanate out of our heart in a way that will give pleasure to God. They must not be ways of gaining other people's approval. They must be ways of not gaining other ways of approval. Now I think all of us wrestle with this issue of trying to gain the acknowledgement or the approval or the accolades of other people. And it's interesting because I think it's especially true in terms of practicing our faith. Because there is a way in which we want other, I think there's a very big temptation for all of us to want other, to know other people to know how spiritual we are, how religious we are, how faithful we are, what good Christians we are. And that ends up becoming the motivation that we, that we do things. And I think it's there all of the time. And 
clergy of all people, I mean, we have a terrible time with with that. Uh, when you go to a, when you go to a, a conference, not infrequently, like one of the first questions people will ask. Can, can anyone guess what's the first question that you're asked frequently if you're meeting another pastor and they don't know you? This, this can be you can actually say something out here. You can be interactive here. Does anyone want to guess what that question might be? How big is your church? Right. How big is your church? And the implication being, the bigger the church, the better your, you know, the better your position. I mean, and, and even in terms of clergy, there is a way in which if we're really successful at a small church, you want to then, you want to be promoted or go to another church, and you want to build your, the goal or is to really be a success and be seen as a success. I remember a colleague of mine, Many, many years ago, many churches ago, I was attending the church. I, I remember someone asked him where he wanted to go. And he, I was actually quite shocked. He said, well, I really, you know, he wasn't, this was in a state, a New England state, but it wasn't here. But for him, the goal was to get a big church, a fair, fairly wealthy church in the suburbs of Boston. Okay? So, so the point is, in terms, you, so you've got to ask yourself, and I'm not trying to diss him because... All of us have these kind of drives and we have these kind of inner rewards and so that we, so that we do things so that we are perceived in a certain way and, we, we, and so that the idea is if I've got a pastor of a, of a really good, if I'm the pastor of a good, chur- of good church in the suburbs of Boston, that's far better and I'll feel far more successful than if I'm uh, at a country church in Kansas. You know how that works. I mean, even things I struggle with, like if I'm driving, if I'm driving in Medfield and someone cuts me off, my reaction, I'm thinking, you know, inside I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seething. And what I would like to have happen is to, to be growing in such a way that God's changing my heart so that I have patience and I can just kind of uh, let that go. But frequently, the first thought that comes to my mind when that happens and you know, I'm really wanting to lay on the horn and say some unpleasant things under my breath. What I'm thinking of is imagine if someone from Medfield sees you. You're the pastor of this church. Boy, are you going to look bad, okay? Now, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to say nasty things to people, so if that will keep me from doing it, but that's, I mean, that's okay, but that's really not what I want it to be about. And see, that's what my faith is not. It's not how I look in public. It's what's really going on in my heart so that, they're, so that they're, my heart and my behaviors are in sync. So, but all, I think all people who practice their faith, whose faith is very important to them, um, I think we all wrestle with this. Do we want, how do we want, why are, why are we doing the things that we do? Are we hoping that other people will take notice and they will think well of us? Or are we doing it because we really want to please God? See, that's, that's the issue. That's the thing that Jesus is getting at. And that's why this first verse, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Now, as Dallas Willard notes, God is incredibly courteous to us. And God does not go to places we don't want him to be. And so what Jesus is saying is, so if you really want, if what you're doing, the real motivation is so other people can see you and take notice and they can think, oh, is Bob a wonderful Christian? Or is Sal, she is really awesome. And that's the motivation that we're doing it. God says, okay, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be part of that, okay? I'm, that's the reward in and of itself. The accolades that you get, that's going to be your reward. It doesn't really count with me. God's very courteous in that way. Which brings us to the first pillar of almsgiving. So almsgiving in Jesus' day was probably, of the three pillars, was probably the most important. And for good reason. Uh, In the Old Testament, um, there are a number of um, passages in the Torah talking about 
taking care of the poor. Let me give you just a, a sample of one or two. In Leviticus 19, 9 to 10, it says this. When you harvest your grain, always leave some of it standing along the edges of your fields and don't pick up what falls on the ground. Don't strip your grapevines clean or gather the grapes that fall off the vines. Leave them for the poor and for those foreigners who live among you. I am the Lord your God. And then in Exodus 23.11, another important passage says, but let, the, but let the land rest during the seventh year. The poor are to eat what they want from your fields, vineyards, and olive trees during that year. And when they have all they want from your fields, leave the rest for wild animals. And then in Deuteronomy 15, there uh, is a, a 1 through 7. I'm going to just read a few, a few of the relevant verses. It says, Every seven years you must announce, the Lord says, loans do not need to be paid back. Then, if you have loaned money to another Israelite, you can no longer ask for payment. No one in Israel should be poor. And so, there was this very important sense in the Torah, which is the law, and then later on with the prophets. The prophets were constantly railing at the religious in, uh, of Judaism to take care of the poor. It's your responsibility to be compassionate and generous. So, so this is laced or, or, or interwoven throughout the Old Testament. So giving was very, very important. But the question then becomes, how is it that we give? Do we give in an ostentatious way? Jesus said uh, in, in verse 2 and 3 when he says, so whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets so that they may be praised for others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And so the, the, the question is, and it's sometimes quite easy to give and we want other people to notice that 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 we are giving or the amount that we are giving and God says well if you want to please me that's not the way it's done you want to give because that's who I am that's I am generosity at the very definition of generosity and I, I want you to give to me in the secret of your heart give because you love me and you want to take care of the poor. Not so that other people can say, ooh, boy, is Bill a great, boy, he is really doing great stuff here. That kills the gift, so to speak, in terms of our following God. Now, Jesus, there's a word hypocrite that actually Jesus used. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word for the theater, in the Roman theater, and there was actually a very big Roman theater in Separus, which was not far from where Jesus grew up. Jesus and father grew up, and some scholars uh, actually wonder if, his, if Jesus and his father at some point didn't work at the theater in Separus. Herod uh, was, had, had this big, this grand theater in Separus where there were all these plays that were going on. And so actors would actually hold the mask in front of their face to be the character that they were going to be. So Jesus is taking that imagery and he's saying, when he talks about hypocrisy and being a hypocrite. And so the hypocrite, what is being done in the heart is out of sync with what the action, the external actions are actually doing. And he's saying, don't be like the actor who has the mask in front of the face. There needs to be always, when Jesus is preaching and in his teaching, he's always interested and he's always working from the inside out. From the inside out. What's going on in the heart and how does that manifest itself? And one of his primary criticisms with the Pharisees is like, you're doing all this stuff in public, but inside... There's all kind of filth and, and 
it's not good inside. And so he says, clean the cup inside first, and then everything will be clean. So he's very, so Jesus is very concerned that if we're going to be generous and if we're giving, we do it for the right reasons. We do it because God is generous and the source of all generosity. God loves the poor and is compassionate, and that we want to please God and serve the poor by doing that. And so that's why, uh, what, that's what Jesus is talking about here. When you think if, if you want, when, when colleges and universities uh, want to raise money, what, what kind of money do you think is easier to maintain? To, to get a big donation that would maintain the maintenance of a building? Or to get a big donation to build the building in which the person could put their name on the building? Any guess? I mean, it's really hard to get an endowment to establish, to take care of the maintenance of a building, right? Because who wants their name on a mop or a broom? But it's far easier to generate money from the, those who can afford it if their name is going to be on it, okay? I, again, this operates at so many levels, and Jesus is so aware of our human shortcomings and this, this hunger that we have, this hunger that we have that, that wants to be recognized and rewarded. Scott McKnight in his commentary says this, There lurks in each of us a desire to be congratulated for our religious deeds. What Jesus aims at is the self-deceit that weaves itself into the fabric of a person's spirituality in which there is not only a notice-me approach, but also an inability to know the problem is present in our own cultural language. It is all about the nurturance and protection of our image. And I think he hits the nail on the head because especially in, our, uh, in the age that we have now, with, we're connected on the internet and Facebook in so many ways, isn't one, of the big, isn't one of the big issues image? What's my image? What are people thinking about me? It's all about posturing. And, and, and so then we do things. And one of the things, even when we go on mission trips, we try to tell the the young the students we hope that you're doing this not so that you can put this on your college application because we know college applications like that now there's nothing wrong with putting this on your college application if the whole the motivation is because you have a heart for God and you want to do it but you see going on a mission trip and then people say oh aren't you wonderful well the question is well why did you go on the mission trip what did you do on the mission trip was this really kind of utilitarian thing so that you can get into college and other people can say, oh, what a wonderful person you are. That's exactly the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. And all of us struggle with this. All of us have to face this. Now, there's one caveat here, too. I don't believe that Jesus is saying you have to hide what you're doing. Now, that may be appropriate, especially when we're giving, giving in, under certain circumstances. The point of what Jesus is saying is, don't, is not hide what you're doing, it's have the right motivation. Because if you remember in Matthew 5, where he says you're supposed to be a light on a hill so that people will see your good works. So the, the point of Jesus is, is saying, if you're going to be giving or if you're going to be doing something else that's, that's, that's really a good thing, you don't have to necessarily hide it. And again, in appropriate times and places, that might be... A, that might be the thing to do. But the point is, take care of the motivation. Why are you doing this? What is really going on inside it? Does, is this flowing out from who you are? And so I would like to suggest for all of us as we begin this Lenten season, this first Sunday, uh, Sunday in Lent, is for all of us to do this kind of an examination, to ask ourselves, why am I doing what I'm doing? If I'm, if I'm coming to church, why am I coming to worship? If I'm in Bible study, why, it, it's a good exercise for us to ask our motivation. Am I doing this because I really love God and I want, I want to learn about God? Or am I doing this so other people will notice and people will think, oh, wow, this person's really spiritual. And so we feel pumped up by that. And so I would invite all of us on this Lenten journey to, to really ask God to give us 
wisdom and grace in looking at our motivation in our faith in terms of our journey of discipleship because what happens in the heart is really what 